Hello, this is Carl James Langford. This is an off-take recording of a class about Sedgeford Archaeology and Active ongoing excavation, which is part of my up-to-date series for Archaeology Cymru. Sedgeford itself, as you can see from the map, um, it's a map from about the turn of the last century, about 1900, so Sedgeford. And you can see sort of middle of the screen a place where it shows sort of clay pits and over on the right there um, is showing some trees. And that's the area of the excavations at Sedgeford at this minute. Sedgeford itself um, overlooks the North Sea and it's in, you could say, a strategic position in my mind that expresses a wide variety of archaeology from a number of different periods. So it's got a timeline going all the way back to the Mesolithic period, Neolithic period, a um, lot going on in the Anglo-Saxon period, a bit in the Roman, uh, medieval and so on. The Sedgeford area itself contains a section of Roman road, the Peddler's Way, a Roman settlement, uh, it's got the village itself, the modern village with the wonderful church, great deal of Anglo-Saxon evidence, Mesolithic evidence, this is in no chronological order, Mesolithic evidence obviously associated with Doggerland, and it's a site that's been excavated since 1996. It's um, an excavator funder uh, site that you pay to go on the excavations, which is uh, where a large amount of archaeological excavations are funded today. So when you pay to go on an archaeological excavation, you're employing the archaeologist and also um, keeping the archaeologist in a job, basically. So using ex expertise to learn something, which is the right way of doing things. Sedgeford itself first mentioned in the Doomsday Book in 1086, and not so long after the, the evidence of the village um, from Anglo-Saxon times, which is being currently excavated. Um, within about 100 years, the whole village moves a bit further north, um, around the church that is illustrated here, um, the Church of St. Mary's at Sedgeford. I love looking at these types of areas of archaeology, like the Ness, a Brodka that we've already looked at, a Binchester that we've already looked at, which you can um, see on my YouTube channel. So there's the church with a wonderful round tower, one of under 30 round tower churches in Norfolk, dating from the Anglo-Saxon period all the way into the medieval period and beyond, and possibly maybe a little bit earlier. Anyway, so um, this is the area of excavation, as I say, sort of immediately south east of the current village of Sedgeford. Extensive areas being uncovered for um, prospecting, as we would call it, and there's been some wonderful finds made, um, burials, finds associated with an Anglo-Saxon village, burials going all the way into the Neolithic period, um, into modern times, when I say modern times, it's not exactly correct, into the Anglo-Saxon period with that cut-off point. Uh, Normans take over the village and then the village moves further up. So we've got a long period of burials over that period. So let's check um, let's check that wonderful word in the terminus um, postquem, um, Neolithic burials, the terminus antiquem, um, Anglo-Saxon Norman burials. So that puts it nicely in context. Excavating on a project like this is that you mean meet lots of interesting people and lots of archaeologists with skills that you wouldn't necessarily come across um, in a university setting because these are archaeologists from a variety of different universities with different backgrounds, different understanding of the landscape, landscape archaeology, uh, the tarscape as Tim Ingold would place it. I usually do these recordings directly in class. The, arch the archaeologists there, the volunteer archaeologists are, and the archaeologists are excavating in the burial area, um, up to 300 burials found at the site, and this is um, a very early burial from the Neolithic period itself, um, a crouch burial. One thing about excavating burials, as we see at Sedgeford with every other house, is 
um, site, I, I should say, um, is that you've got to get suited up because you don't know what diseases these people died of or you don't know what type of bacteria has ended up in the ground, whether it's anthrax or some kind of a plague or some kind of active um, element of bacteria which may affect you today. Um, and working on human remains, you've got to do so with a great deal of respect. Um, and working on human remains myself, you've um, it's very difficult seeing an image like this with the skull on the right hand side and sort of the long bones of the legs, the uh, femur of the legs there. Um, because these people have got a certain sense of dignity and treating them like that on excavations and looking at these images to give them that sense of dignity. Obviously this burial, crouch burial, um, within the area of, of, of the Anglo-Saxon remains directly above this and directly beneath you've got these um, Neolithic crouch burials, which puts the site into a sense of great in-depth continuity. And it's interesting that we've got this sort of transposed burial um, arrangement over the years and then settlement arrangement. In the forefront of the image there, um, you can see a section placed across um, some kind of boundary ditch from, um, I think we're looking at um, an Anglo-Saxon boundary ditch there. Um, rather than a defensive ditch and to section it, to section the void as archaeological terms to get down to the natural to understand um, the difference in the surrounding natural landscape the void in the middle which is the ditch which has been uh, backfilled with sediments and all sorts of things field clearance, field flattening, obviously agriculture over a long period of time the archaeology, um, this is, you can see in the distance there, uh, the, the sort of modern evolving village of Sedgeford, and this is the old sort of Anglo-Saxon village of Sedgeford. Lots of sort of stainings, basically the stainings in the image associated with buildings, slot trenches associated with the Anglo-Saxon buildings, post holes, various other uh, ditches and so on, which have been um, inevitably over a thousand years been, been filled in. Um, agriculture doing its bit to sort of level the landscape. Um, and with the archaeology there, um, the archaeology itself, you're hitting the archaeology, the natural archaeology and the voids and the structures and all the rest of it, about um, a metre in depth. And again, these aren't just volunteers going onto a site with, without any training at all and then working on human remains and all the rest of it intensely supervised running excavations myself you don't put a volunteer on site and just expect them to excavate straight away get them to do pottery washing get them to work in an area that they're not going to be doing any damage moving them slowly progression and lots of people working on this site for sort of two weeks so by the end of those two weeks um, they're they're a lot better skilled than they were to start off with and this whole point of training the next generation of our archaeologists to really understand a site like this, um, a very diverse site, um, you don't just need to look at the archaeology, the bio um, diverse factors associated with this level of archaeology. And you've got quite a number of people actually working um, at this site at that moment. The, the, lots of these images are actually from last year, um, 2018 or 2017. If you want to get to Sedge for this year, I think you're going to be a bit too late because the excavation season has already begun with Sedgeford. So the booking next year um, and obviously don't always expect to get perfect weather like this. It's often great to have damp weather so you can actually get an idea of the context of everything, get an idea of the deep contrasts of all the... Um, all the type of archaeology that you're looking at. So, it's been actually quite a longer slide than usual. Anyway, the next slide coming up. If you if you look at this, where the blue tarpaulin is there, um, you can clearly see these little post holes. It's believed to be. Um, it's said that it's a, a molting structure for for sort of molting um, the grain. Um, 
bring them on to sort of maturity or it's a, a threshing platform or it could actually be the remains of a great Anglo-Saxon hall um, and on the right there you can see a slot trench where there's a trench put in slot trenches are quite useful you put a big beam in a slot trench a big timber in a slot trench um, so you've got one side another timber and another side and you just build up the building like that's quite an easy effective way of building and in up there in the top before the yellow building you can see a group of people huddled around a staining in the ground which is a, a midden um, rather than a burnt area so um, it's only a um, you could say a small scale excavation but it's a large diverse level um, of excavation that they're actually involved in geophysics trial trenching field walking um, sort of processing um, all the rest of it, you know, aerophotography, photography, photography, and all the rest of it. So next slide is about late, late uh, Mesolithic. Lots of 600 pieces of um, uh, Mesolithic flint being found across the site. Um, so these this dates the site back to maybe about 8,000 years ago, 7,000 years ago. Um, and these themselves, the smaller ones, uh, you could refer to as microliths. They're quite small. But the flints here are not large. Uh, lots of scraping tools, lots for hunting. Um, remember, the coastline in the Mesolithic period is is quite some distance away from the less than um, it, it, we, we're looking about um, under five miles away from the coast. The site is today, um, but back in the day, back in the Mesolithic period, you're talking about 50 miles away um, within that Doggerland landscape. Um, so these are the very earliest pieces of evidence for the Sedgeford site. Um, is this associated with, um, you know, a processing landscape where they're processing hides, or is this to do with some kind of um, hunter-gatherer activity? The settlement is a little bit away, or whether the this, this settlement site is actually here under the surface? We can't really say because, um, in lots of ways. That evidence is going to be destroyed by um, a lot later um, activity. Um, a Neolithic burial smack bang in the middle of the Anglo-Saxon site. Um, so they, you could be mistaken when they're excavating to presume that this is an Anglo-Saxon burial. It's found in 2009. But what's intriguing is this crouch burial when it was dated. Um, it was dated roughly. I'll put a middle date there. I know the information in front is different. About 2,300 years BC. Um, the individual is about 20 years old, and because of um, problems of malnutrition and bone um, uh, disformation, um, the remains themselves were difficult to work out if the 20-year-old individual is actually male or female. Being about 20, it's sort of it's very difficult sometimes to work out if it is male or female because the individual may not have given birth which would give away whether it is male or female but again this is a um, wonderful neolithic burial late 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 sort of neolithic period a uh, bronze age period um, and having evidence of malnutrition is that saying that um, um, the conditions weren't great on site or whether this person um, came to the site from elsewhere or um, um, was this the cause of death? Was it due to um, other factors? It's really difficult. But but this person's being buried, as I say, in a crouch formation um, with a couple of really interesting um, objects buried with them. A red deer, deer antler for one and, um, and some flint as well. With the, with the um, Neolithic Bronze Age evidence at site, um, the other thing that could be looked at with the site is again the, the Iron Age period and they, they found another crouched uh, burial um, associated with the with the Iron Age um, found in 2010 it's a rough date of about 300 years BC so we're now into the Iron Age and they found this wonderful thing an antler with a load of uh, not an antler um, um, a cattle um, humerus or femur uh, with 19 coins stuffed into it found on site and, um, and we'll, we'll look at this in a short while so we've got the remains of individuals 
from the Neolithic period and um, Bronze Age um, and the Iron Age. Um, and then obviously that, that sense of continuity here. I think these, this wonderful image of these gold coins is it saying that the people living at the site were exceedingly wealthy um, or is it saying that they had an excess of coins? Um, these coins themselves date to around 50 years BC or thereabout um, and they're from France. They're not local coins but they're, they're absolutely beautiful. So the next image that we're going to go on to is an Iron Age talk and this was found in 1965. Now interesting enough as part of the Sedgeford Heritage Archaeological Research Project Sharp, um, they actually involved metal detect enthusiasts on the site as well. Strange enough this this was found in 1965 as I've said and and the terminal the, the, the little one on the right which is disconnected was found in the field um, and uh, obviously large tracts of the landscape still being sort of ploughed and so on. Um, the archaeology is not really being damaged because it's uh, up to half a metre in, in depth and so you don't, don't have ploughs that deep and they've got an arrangement with the farmer. This was the, That terminal there was found in 2004 and it's part of the talk. So archaeologists, metal detecting enthusiasts working together, two have been unified. If both these art finds hadn't been reported, um, then these two artifacts wouldn't be united. I always say this thing at this point when we're looking at um, Iron Age talks about an iron talk from the Iron Age, which would be a, a lot more difficult to produ produce. Um, and iron being worth a hell of a lot more than gold back in the day in the Iron Age because of the um, you know the time imposed in making it. There was lots of gold um, around then. We were, we were finding you know, literally thousands of talks are being found in Britain from gold talks found in the Iron Age, but none in iron. This is um, we're still discussing the the coins from earlier on, um, and so far they found 39 coins which may be associated with that uh, bone that they were stuffed into. Um, within this and within the very mixed context of the archaeology, the when you find these artifacts buried in the ground, Iron Age artifacts alongside Bronze Age Neolithic artifacts, Mesolithic flints there as well, um, and then lo and behold you're finding Anglo-Saxon cremational urns in the ground as well. Um, so if it wasn't for radiocarbon dating evidence and and you could put in Flinders Petrie's seriation method, uh, it'd be very difficult to sort of get dates because there's a, a, a wide, wide and lots of this stuff is sort of found in the same um, in the same sort of depth really, not the same context or stratigraphy but sort of the same depth. Stratigraphy doesn't have to be horizontal, it can be sort of mixed and sort of undulating but sort of in the sort of same same level. Um, so thank goodness for Willard Libby's invention of radiocarbon dating in um, 1951. Um, radiocarbon dating isn't necessarily completely accurate but with lots of other evidence it helps it make things accurate. When I presented this image to my um, the, the five classes that I teach this to um, uh, the other week, I thought this is a very interesting um, horse, an Iron Age horse, and I thought, is, isn't this great? From from coming from a family of um, of, of horse traders and I've got um, a farrier in the family. I thought, right, the, um, I thought this animal's naturally died. It, it died um, where, it, where it died. Um, they sort of backfilled and it looks quite quaint, but uh, it was put into a pit. The animal was pro probably resting and they polaxed it. Um, extensive cranial damage and um, 
the the eight year old animal um, came to a very unfortunate death. Maybe it had problems with its hooves. Um, it certainly nobody's feasted at its flesh, so there must have been a reason why uh, the animal was, um, can I say, put to sleep, um, put out of its misery. Um, you can't see it, but when I started in examining the cranium, it was um, a heavy bladed instrument um, polaxed the animal, and unfortunately this eight-year-old animal um, in the Iron Age is no longer with us. So we looked at this very early on, and this image in front, the, the evidence of, this is the um, Bronze Age, um, um, more Neolithic uh, body from about 2,300 years BC. Um, um, the, the line between the Neolithic and Bronze Age is now a bit blurred. It used to be um, ending precisely 2,100 years uh, BC, and then you go into the Bronze Age, but it's sort of a bit blurred. So it's a bit why I'm a bit uppity with the dates this evening. Um, on the site itself, um, we've got um, evidence of an Iron Age settlement, which seemingly after the um, Boudican Bodicean revolt around 60, 61 AD, which people were gathering for the Boudican revolt at uh, Caisto, which isn't too far away um, near the coast um, in East Anglia. And uh, so, so the people from this site may have joined the rebellion. Um, and I feel that Boudican revolt is a, um, a load of very upset women with red hair um, who were called Boudica or Boudig, who led a revolt against the Romans, which was nearly successful. They wiped out um, the Ninth Legion that basically ran away. <laughs> and then they had to face the um, 20th, 20th Valley of Vitrix Legion, the, Vi Vi the Victory Legion. Anyway, we've digressed a bit there. So the people may be from this settlement, the site was abandoned for about 50 years and, and maybe the people joined the revolt or maybe they just thought, oh, right, we're going to up sticks and disappear. So the evidence of um, Roman evidence at the site comes in about 50 years later to so about 100 years AD maybe. And the interesting thing in front of you is is that that's a um, that in front of you is a, um, a corn drying kiln. Very interesting. Um, if you read from the um, description there, so we've got about the 100s AD. We've got different stages of settlement there. This isn't a villa. Um, it's not a stone-built structure. It's uh, lots of post holes, framework, sort of linear structures and so on. Um, industrial evidence, um, corn drying evidence as well. And because in the Roman period the farmstead landscape was reorganized around a sort of central sort of depot, a, a villa or a hill fort or something. Um, and um, what we're saying here is that this farmstead didn't have all the fixtures and fittings of a villa. They, they would have um, dried their corn um, and gathered it together without the ergot bacteria problems, sent it to the villa. They, they would have kept over some corn themselves. Um, the the interesting staining there is, is about the intense heat. Would you have intense heat in a corn drying kiln? No, you wouldn't. Because there's something at work with this image. I, I love looking at this image. Not not just describing about the different periods of use. So the Romans is my period. Um, or it should be because I've written two books on the Romans. If anyone's interested, Romans in the Vale of Morgan College. And if you want a copy, just message me. So there you go. Um, so corn drying kiln. Corn drying kiln. So the archaeologists are excavating. They're seeing the intense um, burning around the, si the side. That's where um, you're getting probably temperatures of maybe 400 degrees C. Not like a corn drying kiln. You're only trying to dry the corn, not sort of charcoal it. So this was a giveaway for what's going on there. Um, so the intense heat indicates that something intense is going on. Sometime in about the 300s, um, and a 40 year old individual was burnt in this um, furnace, this um, um, corn drying, um, grain drying oven. Um, deliberately burnt, yes, of course, deliberately burnt. That the um, charcoal, um, coal was arranged in there, given the intense heat. The body was burnt, 
not enough material to burn a body. So when the, the furnace ran out, what's happening, the, the bones are being raked around. Very strange, very strange way of dealing with an individual. And being that this is like in the late 300s, when inhumation burial within the Christian landscape of later Roman Britain, this is very strange. Is, is this um, foul play at foot here? It's a, a cremation that's gone wrong because they, they sort of scraped it all into sort of the crevices and stuff, so sort of back pit fill it, almost as if to cover up something. Or am I just doing um, um, a Mr. Monk there and sort of seeing something that shouldn't be happening? The Anglo-Saxon period with the site. From about the 1820s, 1826, they were finding urns that um, were of Anglo-Saxon age. So you can imagine the antiquarians in the 1820s being fascinated. So you've got, you've got the artefacts, um, the Anglo-Saxon artefacts. You've got the decorated design urns of Anglo-Saxon date cremational urns and in a way really Anglo-Saxon evidence is extremely rare um, and to find the pottery lots of pottery in the Anglo-Saxon period wasn't great but the pottery here was of pretty good standard um, and it's probably being uh, produced very nearby um, when I was doing my postgraduate diploma in archaeology and heritage with Leicester University, we were studying a site called Barkby Thorpe and looking at different Anglo Saxon potteries. So, in the image in front of you, you can see sort of the proper sort of area of the, the Anglo Saxon settlement, and there's going to be a lot more for them to find um, over the years to see how the site's really developing from the sort of Roman period onwards. And I don't often get to talk about the Anglo-Saxon period. We don't have a lot of Anglo-Saxon sites that have been excavated. So looking at this, um, the burials from the Anglo-Saxon period, uh, as well as the settlement, um, as well as the ovens from the Anglo-Saxon period. In 1960, um, by 1960, 126, 126 sets of human remains have been found, mainly Anglo-Saxon, probably a few earlier and maybe some have been misinterpreted, but that's a large number lifted from the site. I'm, I'm very uneasy when human bones are lifted from the site. The human bones, the human remains don't really need to be lifted from the site, they can just simply be backfilled and the plough is not really going to affect them, that's what I feel anyway. So, By 1960, 126 human remains have been removed from the site. And again, it shows of the intensity of people living there. Lots of sets of human remains um, in an area there they named the Boneyard, which um, uh, made it a bit more exciting than that. Um, lots of them are of um, males and females, very few are of, of children's age, so health seemed to be pretty good unlike some of the, the earlier ones and probably people living into a nice age into their 40s, 50s and 60s and not seeing children's remains show of a fairly um, strong and powerful diet and with less children dying you, you've got more people being able to sort of continue um, the settlement on with the continuation of the excavations at the site, extending the site, there is more evidence other than the human remains and other than the settlement. In front of you you can see uh, a furnace. Um, is it a corn drying kiln? Is it a um, bread oven? And in a way it's telling us of an intense character with the landscape. The dead are not too far away. So with, with the 
with those buried and with a much earlier church near to these human remains, corn drying kiln, and the settlement itself, it shows of a very rich nucleated landscape. Something a bit more about the bones. They they haven't found many of the individuals shown as if they had been in some kind of conflict. There, there, there are one or two signs with the human remains, you know, 300 odd human remains now, that the individuals had had injuries from sort of agriculture or maybe they'd been in a bit of a fracas, but naturally surviving and um, living their lives and then being buried on the site itself. Are we talking about pagan burials? Christian burials. It's very likely that the cremational burials are of people from maybe the late 500s, 600s. Um, people that had been on the landscape, intermixing with some Anglo Saxon people coming over as well. The Anglo Saxon people dominating the village, but Maybe it's not that way. Maybe it's just a, a, a native village with Anglo-Saxons living alongside. There's no real sign of conflict there. Um, so when you get cremational uh, burials, internments, within those wonderful urns that, that we've seen, we've, we've, we've seen one example. There are pagan burials and the flex burials, uh, um, the laid out burials, the inhumations. They are probably looking at to being from the Christian period. What's of interest as well, what's of note, is that we've got evidence of eight coffins on site. Eight coffins, uh, wooden coffins. Um, we've also, where we've got coffin fittings and fixtures, not, not the wood, there's the staining there, but nails, fittings that were actually associating with the coffins um, and then the other ones um, lots of the other burials are to be seen um, confined in a shroud so when you're confining a body in a shroud you've got a, a large shroud ring above the head and the the linen itself is dragged through the shroud ring and and that sort of um, around, gathered around the head and a smaller shroud ring um, at the base of the feet and, and the linen's being um, pulled through so the body's wrapped in a shroud and then these are to sort of anchor um, the, the material as the body's being placed into the ground confined burials and they're unconfined burials of people where you where you cut out the ground um, you, you lay the body on the ground you you mark around it you take the soil out and you put the body in the ground unconfined that's what that means so you've got confined in a shroud or a coffin unconfined where the body's just put into a grave cut I've seen I've seen one or two examples of that in my archaeological career um, unconfined um, burials it's probably it's, it's probably the um, cheap and cheerful way of burying somebody but then again if they're Christian um, they're not going to be want to want to be buried with anything and if you bury them with um, shroud rings um, then in a way you're taking the wealth out of the village you can use the metal from the shroud rings for sort of um, nails or, or, or for tools or something. So this is when you look at unconfined burials, maybe not burying somebody naked, burying somebody clothed, uh, because this is sort of um, coming into the the idea of Roman Catholicism um, and that sort of idea, not strictly, but you would have somebody with the dignity of of being buried with clothes. So lots of the lots of the evidence at the site um, tells of occupation in the Anglo-Saxon period for about 200 years. From roughly um, the dates show about 650 to about the 875 period, about um, 200 years. Um, but as I'm saying, it's likely again that the there's a lot there's a much earlier date there um, into the late six uh, late 500s, early 600s when individuals um, are still pagan and not Christian as we see sort of lots of Anglo-Saxons after about the 600, 6, 6, 650, 700 um, being, being Christians and this is what we're seeing. 
So to sort of the, the area which we mentioned known as a chalk pit field, um, that's sort of into the idea of, of, of where the, the lots of um, the people are sort of being buried and sort of the settlements and so on. Um, and as you can see, um, a large hole in the ground there. So um, they, they've gone through various um, levels to bury people um in in these in these large holes in these um sort of they, they, another name for it is um um flexed burials where where your body's sort of flexed out rather than crouched or or any other form so obviously getting an idea of contrast with with the soil and there's intense activity then so obviously the evidence that we're seeing um from the burials in the burial context, taking us to about 8.50 and then the other context of the site, because there's a lot more burials going to be there, a hell of a lot more. There's no way have they, have they found the true extent of the burials on the site. But obviously the, um, this, this, this village itself, um, this, this area of the village, or if that's the right interpretation, is mentioned in the Doomsday Book of 1086. And as I'm saying, um, obviously the church, the new church is the new nucleus of the village, just sort of within yards really of where the archaeological excavation has actually taken place further on down to the south. So I hope everybody's um, getting something out, out, out of this lecture today. And um, obviously I always welcome people um, comment in and subscribe please do um, it keeps me on YouTube and it keeps sort of things going I've just been added by a cup of tea a second so I'm gonna have a quick slurp so what we've got with with the site is is um, lots of boundaries um, and cereal um, processing areas obviously threshing floors and malting houses and and the kilns the, themselves, the, the kiln, um, kilns that you can actually see. So in this illustration here, you can see the building. If you look at the centre of the illustration, um, you can see um, where the post holes are, are there, uh, and you can see sort of two of them areas, those, those sort of circular things, probably uh, more as corn drying ovens rather than anything else. So the, these are sort of the anomalies that they were coming across in, by geophysics in 2013. And, and why do we do geophysics, geophysics magnetometry, resistivity? Um, why, do we, why do we need to do it um, when we're excavating anyway? Well, it's to decide where the excavation is going to go, really. You've got such a large landscape to look at and you can't excavate all of it. And remember, you've got to remunerate the farmer for the area that you're excavating. So you want to be quite clear on where you are. And basically, it pinpoints where the archaeology is. So um, it would it would show anomalies. That That's the right word. Anomalies for the post holes. Um, anomalies for the, the ovens there. Um, and this is the whole point of the technology that we use to pinpoint this wonderful archaeology that a reminder of the site we're looking at Sedgeford look it up on the internet um, um, sharp is the name of the project again Sedgeford heritage archaeological research project um, and there are areas um, they're not just working on that one area that, that we're showing um, it's it's a larger area and some areas are, are pretty waterlogged as well and um, Movement of the village, movement of the settlement further than further more might be indicated by this. Maybe as time went went on, um, it become very unpleasant, as you can see from the archaeologists working here within an area that they've excavated previous, and the the groundwater's come up and sort of inundated. So that gives you a clue some clues to why the village moved and 
changed its um, lo locality. So it's a major site of occupation. It's a major site of this sort of Anglo-Saxon revolution period. But in a way, people through the ages have seen the richness of this landscape. Just because we haven't been able to fit pinpoint the Neolithic Bronze Age settlement, and maybe the Bronze Age settlement directly gave way to the Iron Age, but just because we don't find the settlements now, and lots of that evidence may have been destroyed by, by later work, just because we don't see it now, doesn't mean to say in the past it hadn't been a rich agricultural landscape then as well. This is, this, it, it gives all the hallmarks of being that. Um, and maybe um, in the Neolithic period, based on the evidence of that malnourished individual, that may not be because the landscape wasn't rich in agriculture. They may have just moved in there, become very ill and died at the age of 20. I'm enjoying doing this. I'm just going to have a slurp of my tea. So there you go again. I hope uh, people have enjoyed the way that I've actually done this. I've um, taken these slides and I use them in my, my own class. And so we've got sort of the image and the sort of text. This, this, this material is thanks to um, Sharp um, Sedgemore Heritage Archaeological Research Project website. Um, obviously, changes with the site, given um, the sense of wealth, power and connections, the way people are buried, the landscape of landlords, the vulgaris, the common people, uh, the word uh, warlords um, in this text here, not one I usually use, but uh, merchants and, and monks. Um, in a way, um, after the um, collapse of the Roman world in Britain, it's taken a good 200 years for sort of e economic revival and sort of that economic revival comes in with the agriculture, comes in sort of with um, trade. Um, and, and we've got the link with um, the Peddler's Way, the, the, the so-called Roman road that, that is nearby. Um, so we've got sort of, by this point, the, the sea sort of encroaching on the landscape. And um, so we've got access to the continent to this site. We've got road access all the way down to sort of um, Camelandunum, the old sort of Roman centre. And it's very interesting that we've got a site within a supposed landscape where there was a great deal of turmoil, but it's not really being seen at this site. It's more of a, um, a settled way of life and then that sort of gives way to what you could say um, Viking dominance, but we're not really seeing the Viking dominance here. Um, maybe um, this was a landscape that um, Viking settlers were coming in and saying, right, you know, uh, we're going to have this little bit of land, and but we're going to work with you as merchants and so on with the village. So we don't see that sort of um, destructive discourse. Um, destructive um, uh, destructive nature within in the bodies and we don't really see um, the site falling into um, a diaspora uh, um. Uh, more information here so radiocarbon dating really puts the site up to about 1180 and then you've then got the Church of St. Mary's the Virgin, the modern church, really, the modern village of Sedgwick. Modern village dating to 1205. Um, so it's obviously not modern to us, but it would have been a modern village to the Anglo-Saxons because that's where they're sort of moving up towards. And we're coming into a period of um, change again. Um, an ecclesiastical landscape. Um, a landscape um, associated with, with all that sort of... Um, uh, um, new Age, Norman uh, developed uh, monastic landscape and um, with that constant conflict between the vulgaris, the common people and the lords and the king and the church um, and then uh, the monks and the monasteries and so on. And then the site that we're looking at was abandoned. 
um, the, the immediately south was abandoned, um, was left for a good bit of 700 years. And then because everything, but he's moving around the church and then coming towards the end of this lecture, really, we, we've got um, the likes of in 1915, this becomes the location of an aerodrome with one plane by 19 so that's 1915 with the royal navy um, air squadron or air service um, and then by about um, 1916 the um, royal flying corps moves onto the site um, and by 1918 there's 1200 personnel based at the site um, with various buildings storage buildings buildings for planes they've got um, three squadrons uh, at site and 1918 November they're building a huge sort of hangar um, extending the aerodrome and the site's abandoned um, again another period of abandonment so this building itself is from sort of 1916 1917 something like that it's abandoned um, another period of abandonment but this isn't a period of hundreds of years that the site's abandoned the site's abandoned interwar period for about 20 odd years more or less precisely and then they're going to be using this as a decoy site for the, the Luftwaffe is coming over and it's now a decoy site um, instead of the Luftwaffe bombing the the local um, aerodrome um, in the Second World War they're going to be there's going to be lights here artificial planes and all the rest of it and they're going to be bombing the hell out of this site why do archaeologists need to excavate a site like this modern archaeology the simple reason why is because um, lots of records weren't kept um, and these are the footings in front of you which were excavated in 2009 um, the concrete footings and the stone footings of buildings put up in um, 1915 1916 up to 1918 um, some of these buildings were taken down in 1918 and if they remained after um, 1919 um, they, they, these were the decoy buildings which would entice the Luftwaffe to bomb here and obviously one or two bombs would go astray into the um, modern villagers said for the whole point is to try and keep, get the Luftwaffe away from the cities and the aerodromes and to try and restrict um, the death toll and it worked uh, the Luftwaffe wanted to um, within the uh, the Battle of Britain wanted to wipe out 150,000 people in the Battle of Britain. Well, it didn't happen. That was the death toll for the war um, in Britain. Um, and it was because of these decoy sites. Um, and in a way, then again, these fields are then abandoned after the war. Um, and another period of abandonment. And then, ironic really, that um, we see from... 1996 the new activity at the site is the archaeologists that's the new period um, of occupation that's the new occupation layer at the site so more of these sort of wonderful buildings to be seen at the site um, and as we're coming to the end please subscribe please like please watch more on my videos love to hear your comments let's keep them positive a reconstruction of the anglo-saxon village again more evidence of these um, corn drying kilns one stage of excavation, another stage when all the soil has been taken away. Um, and I've really enjoyed this sort of lecture talking with you. It's been more personal and sort of putting one of my um, live lectures up. And this itself is an Anglo-Saxon um, cooking pot or a, a jug with a spout on it. Uh, more Anglo-Saxon burials coming up. And I'd like to thank you very much for watching today.